extra hour of sleep today. Let me direct you to the back of the bulletin. We've got a lot of upcoming events and activities for November. We'll be adding some more for December. Starting today, this is a fantastic day because right after church, we're all meeting over in the fellowship hall to help set up for the Christmas Bazaar. So that's going to be amazing. You definitely want to stay after church for that. It's going to be a lot of fun, and we really could use your help. So I will cut off 12 seconds of the sermon if you go. <laughs> Maybe. So that's today. Um, November 12 is drop off of baked goods and bizarre donations between the hours of 1 and 6 p.m. And the Christmas Bazaar, of course, is November 13th, coming up on Saturday, 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. We could use your help uh, clean up and all sorts of different things with that. And you definitely want to show up for this. It's going to be a lot of fun. Next Sunday is Scout Sunday. We will also be honoring our veterans during that time. And I got a question. In the holiday season, what is the number one most requested item and the least donated? Socks. 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 What's the number two item? Socks. Underwear. Oh, you guys are good. <laughs> Yeah, we need socks and underwear up here. That, that's kind of important. So I want you to bring them in new, okay? Socks and underwear would be great. And uh, Sue Ottinger will be handling a lot of that stuff as far as if you have any questions. They're going to be provided to the Anchored Ministry. It's a community service ministry based in Elberson, uh, directed to meeting the basic needs of the homeless. It's really important. Let's all contribute to that and let's fill that up with socks and underwear. Sounds like a fun way to have November. Christmas Bazaar Pumpkin Pie Pre-order. Okay, um, there are some forms back there. No, Sunday, November 14. The pickup is Saturday. Okay, gotcha. All right, so we need the pre-order form. A whole pie is eight, half pie is five. And you can have Saturday pickup or you can have Sunday pickup, but we need to have the orders in ahead of time. So if you're interested in getting a fantastic pumpkin pie, you definitely want to do that. Get that in today. Sue yeah, today. is going to be the one getting that. As of here, even has her phone number on the thing. So if you forget, you can give her a call. Get that taken care of. And a bunch of other things coming up. Uh, November 21, we're going to be starting to set up for Advent. It's going to be a fun Advent this year. We're going to be adding some things to it. And the theme is going to be gifts. As we talk about the special gifts that we get at Christmas and looking at that with an interesting slant. Thanksgiving service is going to be at the Coventry Church of the Brethren on November 21st at 6 p.m. And if you're really looking ahead, December 24 is our Christmas Eve service. One service this year, 7 p.m. Other announcements need to be brought to our attention this morning. Marcia Seward did that well? Yes, we did. Really? And he covered it. Yeah. Okay. Consider the following. This was an actual sign that was found in the church nursery. It said, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. <laughs> or the following phone recording. I'm not available right now, but thank you for caring enough to call. I am making some changes in my life. Please leave a message after the beep. If I do not return your call, you are one of those changes. <laughs> so today we're going to focus and find out what it means to make a meaningful change in our life, our spiritual lives, our physical lives. Let us prepare our hearts and our minds for worship.
come together to celebrate God's power to change people's lives. We thank God for the many lives that He has transformed by His power and grace. The Christ who revealed Himself to St. Paul and transformed His life can do the same for us. We pray for Christ to visit us and remake us to be His faithful disciples. Let us join our opening hymn, Here, O my Lord, I see you face to face, number 336.
with such enthusiasm that we will become vital members of your church. We pray through Christ our Savior. Amen. To all who seek forgiveness through confession of sin and through the commitment to change, God responds with mercy and with grace. Ever and always, God welcomes us home to live with joy in the world and to look with joy and hope toward the time ahead. Let us now walk in truth, finding the freedom as we celebrate Christ's life and relying on the Spirit's power. These things we can do by the grace of God. Amen. Please be seated.
of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable unto you, O Lord. Amen. The prophet Jeremiah asked some 2,700 years ago or so, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may he also do good that are accustomed to do evil. In other words, can a person change his or her basic nature? Can the cruel become kind? Can the vulgar become refined? Can the coward become courageous? Interesting question, and an important one. Few of us, I guess if we were honest, could say we're all that we really want to be. And that's good, because there always should be some room for improvement. We should never be satisfied. But the human history is fraught with repeating the same mistakes over and over and over again. How many of you can relate to Jack Parr's classic line? Looking back, my life seems like one long obstacle race, with me as its chief obstacle. <coughs> is there any hope for us? Is it really possible for us to make a deep, meaningful change? And the answer is, of course. We can change. Millions of people have experienced change in their lives. In our scripture today, I would like you to consider for a moment St. Paul. Paul, by his own admission, persecuted the early Christian church. He was a zealous advocate of the Jewish faith. Rather, I guess we should say he was so fanatically attached to a particular kind of orthodoxy, he just simply could not tolerate any conflicting views. I think that it's really important to make that distinction because it's possible also to have the same kind of misguided zeal, even for the cause of Christ. The important thing, however, is that Paul changed. He became the great missionary apostle for Christianity. But it was not that he simply changed one orthodoxy for another. It was much deeper. He was changed. He was changed in his heart, in his mind, in his spirit. When we read 1 Corinthians 13, that beautiful tribute to love, and ask whether the writer of such a work would be capable of persecuting persons of another faith. Think about that. The change in Paul's life was truly dramatic. So change is a wondrous possibility for all of God's people. Indeed, it might be one of those key ingredients in the concept of the image of God in which the Bible tells us we were created. Of all God's creatures, we seem to be the only ones who possess this quality. We can change. As Spencer Marsh has noted, all of God's creatures, we alone, can be creative. We can change. Animals are not creative. Rather, they're instinctive. For this reason, the beaver dams, the birds' nests, and the anthills of the 2020s are no different than the anthills of the 1220s. But as humans, we can create entirely new models. We can take the raw materials given to us by God and arrange them in a pattern that bears the stamp of an individual creative mind. Taking words, color, clay, musical notes, brick, marble, a man or woman may shape something that has never been something totally fresh and new. And we find this activity fulfilling. Why? Because we're living up to the image of God. 
that's woven deep in our innermost being. The drive towards creativity is related to our ability to change. We do possess the capacity for change. We've seen people change. If you think about it, over a set period of time, almost everyone changes to a certain extent. We call that maturity. Sometimes for better, sometimes for worse. But change does indeed take place. Of course, the change that took place in St. Paul's life was much more dramatic, much more sudden than the kind that most of us will experience. Few of us will see a blinding light or hear the actual voice of Christ as St. Paul did. But we can change nevertheless. <clears throat> so the question becomes, how can we realize our dreams? How can we remedy what we consider to be our defects? How can we be what we have never been before? Let's look at some simple steps that can lead to change. The very first, most important to get you started, is desire. Do you really want to change this behavior? Do you really want to change who you are? Do you really want to be more than you are? Are you sufficiently dissatisfied with your present state that you're willing to pay the price that change requires? Dwight Moody once said that if he could get a man to think for five minutes, just five minutes about his soul, he was almost certain he could be converted. Just five minutes. All it would take if we truly assess our current spiritual condition. Some people are not even aware of their deepest spiritual needs because they never, well, never given any thought about it. They never give any thought to where they stand with their Creator, to where their soul is. There must be, first of all, that desire to change. There also has to be a design for change. Constructive change happens best when we plan for it. Successful people are goal setters. They visualize, they strategize. Skip Ross in his book, Say Yes to Potential, tells about John Goddard. Goddard may have been the paramount goal setter of our time. His story was published in Life Magazine back in 1972. He was 15 years old when he overheard his grandmother and aunt saying, If only I had done this when I was young. Those words stuck with him. He resolved not to be a part of the army of only ifs. And so he sat down and he decided what to do with his life and he wrote down 127 goals. Let's see how many are on your list. There were 10 rivers he wanted to explore. 17 mountains he wanted to climb. He wanted to have a career in medicine, visit every country in the world, learn to fly an airplane, retrace the travels of Marco Polo, ride a horse in the Pasadena Rose Parade. Other goals were to read the Bible from cover to cover, read the works of Shakespeare, Plato, Aristotle, Dickens, and a dozen other classic authors. He wanted to become an Eagle Scout. He wanted to dive in a submarine. He wanted to play the flute and the violin. He wanted to go on a church mission, marry, and have children. He had five. And read the entire Encyclopedia Britannica. In 1972, John Goddard was 47 years old. And he had accomplished 103 of his 127 goals at that time. As a result, he became a highly paid lecturer, and he toured the world telling of his adventures. Change takes place when we have the desire 
and we can set the design. We also need a dynamic for change. In other words, we need power. Power that is not our own. Of course, this is where St. Paul reenters the story. Paul, or Saul, as he was known before he met Christ on that Damascus road, seemingly had no desire and no design for change. This change came because of God's desire and design. He says in verse 11 and 12 that the experience he had was not of man. I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but it came by the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is clear that Paul was uniquely chosen by God for a particular mission. You and I may never experience such a dramatic rending of the veil, but the same power that invaded Paul's life truly is available to all of us. It's the power of the indwelling Christ. And such power comes from spending time in quiet fellowship with God. We need that meditation time. Change comes from desire and design, also from a dynamic source of power from outside ourselves. One more thing. Change comes when we dare. We dare to take a first step, because getting started is always the hardest part. New Yorker magazine, sometime back they had a cartoon entitled, Nanook Goes South. First frame shows Nanook in the north, and he's in the cold north wearing his heavy parka. The second frame shows Nanook in the same outfit in the sunny south. He's boiling in his parka, says the caption. But old habits die hard. <laughs> old habits do die hard. But they do die if we dare to take that first step. Change involves risk. It requires stepping out. It means breaking the mold. But for those who dare to realize their dreams and remedy their defects, it's also a grand exhilaration. It's a story of a man who is seriously depressed, and he has every night the same recurring dream. He's in an alley. He has a bicycle. He gets on the bicycle. He rides down the alley, and ahead of him is a pothole. And it covers almost the entire alley, and it's deep. It's got a little space on one side or the other, and he tries the one side, but he doesn't make it, and it falls into the pothole, and it breaks the tire. And he wakes up. <coughs> same dream the next night. He takes the same bike, he's down there, he tries the other side, the same result. Another night, he tries to jump over the pothole with horrible results. And he wakes up night after night after night and it drives him mad. He's not sure what to do about this. Until finally, he has an idea. He goes out there, he rides his bike, the pothole's coming up, he tries to swerve out of the way, he falls into the pothole, and he breaks the tire. But he spent time in his waking life learning how to repair a bicycle tire. He now knows how to do it. So he doesn't wake up from his dream, and he spends time, and he's got an extra two to be brought with him, and he repairs the tire, and he's able to get out of this hole and continue on his way. The next night, he has the same dream again. It's still there. Not a problem. He knows how to repair a tire. It'll take a little time. He goes in, gets, falls into the pothole, changes the tire. Night after night, he knows how to change the tire. He takes care of that. Then he realizes there's another possibility. So on the next night, he gets on his bike. And instead of going down the alley this way with the pothole, he goes that way where there isn't a pothole. That's change. Sometimes we only see the problems that are ahead of us and don't see that there's another possibility, another way to go out. 
Ann Landers queried a writing from an anonymous source that speaks to our need. It was entitled, The Dilemma. To laugh is to risk appearing a fool. To weep is to risk appearing sentimental. To reach out to another is to risk involvement. To expose feelings is to risk rejection. To place your dreams before the crowd is to risk ridicule. To love is to risk not being loved in return. To go forward in the face of overwhelming odds is to risk failure. But risks must be taken because the greatest hazard in life is to risk nothing. The person who risks nothing, does nothing, has nothing, is nothing. He may avoid suffering and sorrow, but he cannot learn, feel, change, grow, love. Changed by his certitudes, he's a slave. Only a person who takes risks is truly free. You can change. The formula is simple. There must be desire, a design, a dynamic, a sense of daring. But it can happen. Think about what change you can make in your life. Think about what change you can make in your life that will improve our church. Throw that pebble into the pond and see where those ripples will take you. Amen. Any joys and concerns you'd like to bring up today? I would like you to take a look at our prayer list. Keeping those people in your thoughts and prayers. So. Lynette and I visited Kathy Nyman yesterday afternoon, and she's doing very good, uh, as best as can be, with all her multiple you know, health issues and stuff. But she was in good spirits, and we had a really nice visit with her, and she's missing all of us. Excellent. So keep her in your prayers, um, and just think of that heck, laugh and the smile that we got to experience yesterday from her. Wonderful. Thank you. Others? Yeah, I have a joy. Uh, my youngest grandson uh, was confirmed last Sunday. Very nice. In Naperville, Illinois. <laughs> and today has its first communion on All Saints Sunday. Ah. So that gives special significance to me because I believe that on All Saints, uh, we transcend with God's time, distance, and we're going to be at the same table as we celebrate the sacrament. Wonderful. Congratulations. Very nice. No, he did all the work. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine so. Any others? Let us pray. We thank you, God, for this wondrous, ordinary day. Grant us the wisdom to unwrap this day as a gift. <coughs> Engage us in opening its hours with care, prizing the people we meet within it, acknowledging you as its center. By your grace, we will discover to be just what we need. Increase, we pray, our faith and our faithfulness. How often we have difficulty building belief. We misuse or fail to identify the resources you provide with such loving consistency. Help us to help one another grow as persons of spirit, as followers of Christ. Teach us to recognize when we have turned aside from you, when we have spiritual blind spots and only see what we want to see. Enable us to confront the ways we neglect to practice the outreach that draw you close. Be with those who are in need. Be with those who require the special care of your grace. Help them to heal in mind, body, and spirit according to your word. We offer our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
would our hymn of communion be known to us in breaking bread, number 342. Gifted by the presence of your Holy Spirit, we offer ourselves to you as we unite our voices with the entire family of your faithful people everywhere. And let us sing. saying, This is the New Testament of my blood shed for you. As often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. We remember Christ's promise not to drink of the fruit of the vine again until the heavenly banquet at the close of history. And we say boldly what we believe. 
Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Bless this bread and bless this fruit of the vine. Bless all of us in our eating and drinking at this table that our eyes may be opened that we may recognize the risen Christ in our midst, in each other, and in all for whom Christ died. Amen. At this time, we can take the top seal off and move the wafer. Take and eat the body of Christ broken for you. Second seal, so we have the cup. Drink the blood of Christ shed for you. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us at your table by granting us the presence of Jesus Christ. Strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and send us forth into the world in courage and in peace, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit, through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. 